Hello, my name is Mark Melstein. I'm the director of the Center for Sustainable Global Enterprise at the Cornell University SC Johnson College of Business. For nearly two decades, the center has been conducting applied research and teaching on growth opportunities companies pursue through competitive strategies that address the world's most pressing social and environmental challenges. I want to welcome all of you and thank you for joining us for the sixth annual Cornell Business Impact Symposium. Today is the second of four panels taking place this week. The symposium will culminate on Saturday with the finals of our first Cornell Impact Investing Competition, which we hope you will join us for. CBIS is only possible because of the hard work of a lot of people who deserve recognition. First, thank you to all the students from the seven graduate and undergraduate clubs that collaborate with us at the center to organize CBIS. Also, I want to thank my center colleagues, Monica Twinar and Safiya Abdulhamid, for all their efforts that make this possible each year. Additionally, we want to thank eCornell for enabling us to hold this event virtually for the second year in a row. Finally, I want to thank Corning for their sponsorship of this year's event. I want to remind everybody before we begin that you can use the chat function at any time to post questions you may have for the panel. And with that, I want to turn it over to Isabel Amlet, who is with the Cornell Sustainability Consultants, who will introduce tonight's session. Thank you, Mark. And uh, thank you to everyone for joining us for tonight's panel discussion, Innovating for Resilience, Food and Agriculture and the Age of Climate Change. This panel has been organized, as Mark was saying, by the Cornell Sustainability Consultants. We are an interdisciplinary pro bono student consulting group that works to foster circularity and the adoption of sustainable practices in industry. Tonight, this panel will focus on controlled environment agriculture, which is an exciting new sector in the agricultural industry that takes indoor spaces and transforms them into high-tech, highly efficient farms. We have an incredible group of panelists from all across the controlled environment agriculture industry whose companies specialize in everything from vertical farming to greenhouse growing to consulting with controlled environment growers. Now I'll hand it over to our moderator, Dr. Neil Matson of the Cornell Controlled Environment Agriculture Program. Thank you, Isabel. It's a pleasure to be here talking to you about something I'm very passionate about, controlled environment agriculture, which is production of high nutrient density crops in greenhouses and uh, plant factories. Um, so I'll be moderating this evening. Um, we'll uh, divide our time into kind of two sections. So I have a bunch of pre-formulated questions um, that we'll go through with the panelists. Um, for, and then in the second half, we'll be taking questions from all of you attendees. Um, so please um, submit your questions and we look forward to getting to those too. Um, so first, I'm going to invite each of the panelists to introduce themselves, and I'm going to call you um, alphabetically by your first name, um, so you can be prepared for that. And if you could spend about a minute or so um, introducing yourself and your business, um, maybe a little bit about the company that you represent and its mission, and what types of um, products they sell. Um, so I'd like to start with Alina Zola Toreva from Aero Farms. Could you go first? Absolutely. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you today, um, especially because Cornell is my alma mater. Um, so very, very proud to be here this evening. Um, so I represent a company called Aero Farms, um, actually founded by a uh, cor former Cornell professor named Dr. Ed Harwood, who used to teach at the um, uh, Cornell um, Agriculture um, School and Cal's um, in Dairy Sciences. Um, in Aero Farms, we are a vertical farming company um, and an agricultural platform. And our mission is really to grow the best plants possible for the betterment of humanity. So we grow everything from leafy green vegetables for commercial production, um, as well as a variety of other crops, um, both for commercial production um, and consumption and also to solve some of agriculture's biggest uh, biggest challenges. So uh, we're really a large um, platform organization um, and that's really the way that we see ourselves as problem solvers in the field of uh, food supply chain and um, agriculture in general. Um, we're based in Newark, New Jersey. That's where our headquarters farm is, but we have a footprint that's quite global. Um, we have farms um, in Abu Dhabi, um, in other uh, states of the United States, and we're very rapidly expanding. So it's been, it's really, really exciting to, to be here and to chat with all of you today. And I look forward to, to your questions and to sharing more. 
Thanks, Selena. Um, next, um, Henry Gordon Smith is the founder and CEO of Agritecture. Henry, could you introduce yourself? Hi, Neil, and hi, everyone. Thank you for having me and Agritecture here today. It's always an honor to speak with Cornell. So um, I'm Henry Gordon Smith. Agritecture is a company that I founded six years ago, and we are an advisory firm and digital services company. So what that means is we provide advisory services to clients all around the world, 26 countries to date, over 130 clients. And what we do is we provide them with data, strategy, farm design services, mostly related to controlled environment agriculture, but more broadly related to local and urban agriculture. And the digital services part is our new software, which relates to planning CEA operations. So I'm really excited to answer any questions you have today. And it's just really exciting to talk about this topic. Thank you, Henry. Then our next panelist is Paul Salou, who's the founder and CEO of Little Lee Farms. Great, uh, great to be here today uh, at another great Cornell event. Neil, continue the great work. So I'm the founder and CEO of Little Lee Farms, and we are the largest grower of baby leaf lettuce, I believe, in the world, certainly in the United States. And we, uh, our headquarters are in Devons, Massachusetts. Uh, we have a state-of-the-art facility there. And in five plus years in the market, we basically are the number one packaged salad, you know, in New England, number four in uh, the Northeast and number 10 nationally. That's, a, that's as a brand. So we're one of the only CEA companies that has successfully competed in the marketplace with the California guys that still dominate. Um, so we have a long way to go, a lot of growth opportunities for CEA, and we're rapidly expanding. We're more than doubling our footprint right now with our second greenhouse located in McAdoo, Pennsylvania, which is under construction. So look forward to being on the panel. Thank you, Paul. And last but certainly not least, we have um, Shireen Santosham, um, who's the head of strategic initiatives from Plenty. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm representing Plenty, which is also a vertical farming company out of California. Our headquarters are in South San Francisco, but we have a dedicated research facility in Laramie, Wyoming, um, and we're building uh, probably the largest output vertical farm uh, in Compton, and it's under construction now. And so we were founded maybe about four or five years ago, um, have been, we service about 50 grocery stores um, in, in the Bay Area and our uh, new farm will service um, over 400 uh, across California. And so uh, really excited to have this conversation with all these leaders here on this industry. Great. Thank you, Shireen. And I have one more kind of get to know you type question that I'll ask of, of each of you. And then we have some broader topics that we want to get into. Um, so this one is what was the career pathway that led you to controlled environment agriculture? And we could go alphabetically again. Alina, could you start with that one? Yeah, absolutely. And I love that I'm first because my last name starts with a Z. So I've always been last. So this has been, this is great, Neil. Thank you. Um, so actually at Cornell, I studied uh, nutritional sciences and dietetics um, in uh, human ecology. And I ended up uh, getting my, my uh, registered dietitian license, which I still hold to this day. Um, but what I was always really passionate about were, um, were systems and public health and the food system and how they interfaced. Um, and I, the first couple of, of years I, I, in my career path, I was, was looking for ways to bring those two things together. And I uh, met um, uh, Mark and, and Ed and David in, in the early years at Aero Farms. Um, now over six years ago is when I joined the organization and I met them around eight years ago um, when they were first starting to um, really expand um, the company and the vision and I really saw this um, as the future of food. And I remember walking into their research and development facilities for the first time in downtown Newark and something clicked um, in my mind. And I, and I haven't looked back since. And today I'm the marketing director, but I've really uh, been involved in uh, many, many, many different um, aspects of the organization and of the growth of the company. So it's been super exciting to, to see um, both AeroFarms grow and the industry grow um, and uh, the different players evolve. It's extremely exciting. So that's a little bit about my background. Thank you. Henry, would you tell us a little bit about your career pathway? 
Yeah, I really enjoyed hearing that story, Alina. And I'll try to tell mine as short as possible. There's some podcasts if you want to hear the longer version. But I um, graduated, graduated with a political science degree, and I was looking at climate-induced migration and internship, and I just started thinking about climate change and how important it was. And I, I needed to shift my career towards something that was solving that problem. And I started three blogs, all related to sustainability. And one of them was called Agritecture. And that one had the most interest and got really popular. And so I started studying it more. I took online classes in food security and urban agriculture. And then I applied for a job at Bright Farms, which back in the early days was doing kind of integrated facades into buildings concept. So building integrated agriculture. And this was also a really popular topic on the blog. So I bought a one-way ticket to New York City and I try, I went for the interview. I didn't get the job. And I just sort of stuck around in New York trying to build a network of urban farmers and learn as much as I could. Meanwhile, the blog was growing and then we got our first consulting request and it was about vertical farming. And so since then, we've just sort of been answering those questions and continuing to blog about it. That's great. The proverbial one-way ticket to New York City and you weren't even part of Broadway. <laughs> Um, yeah. Paul, Paul, can you tell us about your story? Sure. So I'm from a farm family. Um, my brother Mark runs our um, family business, Pride's Corner Farms, which is the largest grower of ornamental plants uh, in, in the Northeast. So, you know, lower tech greenhouses, uh, but very large operation over several hundred, hundred acres. Um, so I, I left that as a, as a younger guy and uh, pursued uh greenhouses and other agribusinesses. So uh, my former greenhouse business was Backyard Farms, which is a 42 acre tomato greenhouse operation I built in Madison, Maine, and uh, started Little Leaf about six years ago. Um, you know, in response to, I didn't see any business models out there that were set up to really take on the California producers. So that was always our target. And so from day one, we've been focused on the highest quality cost of production and, uh, and following all the good advice from the legends of like Lou Albright and, uh, and of course, Neil, you're in his footsteps. But um, Cornell's been a really important thought partner. And if anyone who listened carefully to what they had to say, if you followed it, I think you'd be successful in the CEA business. Thanks, Paul. And Shireen, can we hear a little bit about your background? Sure. Um, my uh, career path has pretty pretty much uh, been quite a random walk of uh, different industries. Um, I did my graduate work at Harvard with a joint degree between the business school and the Kennedy School um, in, in uh, international development. So I started out uh, after graduate school um, at McKinsey, the consulting firm, and then did international work around um, technology and bridging the digital divide and then decided I wanted to focus more domestically. And so um, got a job working for the mayor of San Jose as the chief Innov in innovation officer for the city. So I ran tech policy for essentially the largest city in Silicon Valley for about four years. Um, super interesting work. Uh, government work can be hard as, as everybody knows. Um, and so I uh, was looking to go back to the private sector, wanted to work in tech for good. Um, and there's frankly a short list of companies that that do that kind of work, have a passion for food as well. And so I um, I actually cold LinkedIn uh, Matt Barnard, who's our co-founder on LinkedIn and said, you know, will you talk to me for 10 minutes? And he said, have breakfast with me on Saturday at 7 a.m., which is certainly farmer's hours. So, um, you know, that turned into three or four breakfasts and a job offer. And so now I help to lead corporate strategy um, as well as a number of um, special initiatives for um, our executive team. You're on mute, Neil. Thank you. I have to put a dollar into a jar now. Um, so now I'm going to ask uh, some more broader questions. Uh, don't feel obligated to uh, for all the panelists to respond to them, but if we could get a couple of you responding to each of the questions, I think that'd be quite interesting. Um, so my next question is, how do you see the global food system and food security changing in the future? Um, and where do you see controlled environment agriculture fitting into those, those changes in the global food system? Does someone want to take a first stab at that? I mean, it's a really big question, um, how long in the future we're thinking about. But I suppose to answer the second question, 
I think that controlled ag- environment agriculture is a bright future. I think that the fundamentals of climate change, of consumer demand for quality are in our favor as a sector. And so I think there'll be growth. And I think that growth will be most dramatic in the regions where the drivers for things like vertical farming and greenhouses, growing indoors, pesticide-free, reduced food, ma- et cetera, reduced water are going to make the biggest difference. That's where they'll be. I also think there's going to be a heavy focus on training and education to fill the jobs gap that's necessary to fill this sector. And I think that policy will actually catch up with it. Um, I think it's slower now, but I think it'll catch up with the sector in five years or so to encourage it in those hotspot regions. Does someone else want to take a stab at that? You can either raise your hand or just start talking. Um, Alina, yeah, I see you unmuted. Yeah, big, big topic. One of my favorite topics to have late nights over a cognac with, with my urban agriculture friends. Um, but, you know, the, the truth is, is that we live in a very unpredictable um, and very unpredictable and volatile times uh, because of climate change, um, because of population growth uh, globally, because of the um, intense weather events that we're seeing now that we're going to continue to see because of um, water scarcity, um, freshwater contamination, um, because of what we're seeing with COVID-19 and supply chain challenges um, when we have to close borders. Um, what, what, where, what I'm getting at is um, what we're seeing more and more of a, uh, of a, of a case, um, even more so than before, for controlled environment agriculture as a tool uh, to help us um, uh, secure a, a, a resilient uh, food future uh, globally. So both both locally, regionally, uh, where we are, but, but also um, in areas like the Middle East, where, like, for example, uh, where we're building out a farm in Abu Dhabi, and they import and upwards of 80% of their food. Now, when you have during during times of, of uh, well-being and safety um, and open borders, that's all good. But um, in times when we're, we have uh, uh, issues with that, like what, what we saw in the last year, it becomes a huge liability and a huge challenge. So um, I think the, the need to build resilient regional food systems um, globally um, is has, has is making a huge case for controlled environment agriculture of all forms, um, which is which is really really exciting for our industry. Thank you. Um, that's a nice segue into another question that I wanted to ask um, related to the last year and how has COVID nineteen impacted the CEA sector from your viewpoint? So I'll I'll, I'll take that one. So. You know, with the last 13 months, it's gone by in a blur. I think a lot of people can can agree with that. But we have a, a diversified, and thank God it was diversified, uh, retail, grocery, and food service business. And sometime, you know, in March of 2020, the food service business basically completely collapsed. I mean, no one was eating in restaurants. So what we saw is grocery sales surged and online sales surged. So, you know, the uh, kind of the, the, the state, you know, tried and true, reliable grocery industry had a banner year uh, in the midst of a hundred year pandemic, because that was oftentimes where the only people could go to get food. So we were tied to the grocery industry. So we certainly, you know, bore the extra cost of protecting our workers and doing all the things to, uh, associated uh, around uh, keeping everybody safe. But we had, we had a great year, and it was directly tied to the fact that the grocery industry had a great year. Thanks. Uh, Shireen? Yeah, I would um, echo everything that, that Paul said. Um, you know, we saw a tripling of demand for our products over the last year. And so what I think happened um, from an industry perspective is it actually accelerated and helped make the business case around vertical farming much more clear um, and CEA in general much more clear. And you even saw, I mean, we essentially saw um, a billion dollars of investment in the space in this last year, as well as like a rapid expansion um, of capacity. And so, uh, you know, I think for the this industry, it's sort of proving out uh, that we do need more local production, um, both from a sort of national security uh, interest um, perspective, but also that um, it really matters uh, in times like this. 
Uh, Neil, could I say something shortly about this? So we, um, we actually did a census of CEA operators uh, in 2020, and the focus was COVID-19. So if you go to our website and scroll down, you can just download the CA census. What's interesting there is a lot of the growers did feel a lot of optimism um, through the experience, and actually they did have some positive shifts um, as as was experienced by Paul. Um, that that you, you know there was an adaptation, but they were very positive about it. There's a lot of insights in there about how they see technology and crops. So I just wanted to highlight that just in case anybody wants that free report. Great, thank you, Henry. Um, the next question I wanted to ask is um, what. Do you see as opportunities for CEA in terms of urban agriculture? Well, I'll, let me let me. Um, I'm I'm a big believer in peri-urban agriculture. So again, that was um, first articulated by Lou Albright at, at Cornell. And uh, my experience is doing business in cities. It's a it's a very expensive place to do business. And if you're 20, 30 miles. Uh, 40 miles where we are in Devons outside of Boston, you end up getting, you know, much cheaper real estate. You can select your energy. Uh, you know, we're tied to solar fields, so you can do a lot of sustainability things that I think are difficult in, in the urban uh, market. So I'm a big, big believer in basically returning the suburbs, albeit very differently with high tech greenhouses uh, back to where they are feeding the cities. Thanks, so. Henry. Yeah, so our philosophy at agriculture about this is that there's, you know, there's not only there's not a million ways to do CEA um, in and around cities, um, but there are a few. And so it's about understanding your goals. If you want a more experiential farm, if you want a, a high profit farm, if you want a high variety farm, if you want a farm that's focused on sequestering carbon, if you want a farm that's focused on education, right? There's so many different kinds. There's not an infinite amount, but there's different ones. So we focus on setting the right goals first since the majority of entrants to CEA, according to our census, um, are have zero years or one year of experience. So they're new. So they need to really set goals properly at the beginning. So that's the first focus. And then when I think of it from that perspective, I actually see a wide variety of options across urban areas and per peri-urban areas. But I agree with the fact that if you're going for large scale, there's no need to force yourself to be in the center of the city. It simply doesn't add up, right? You can still supply the city by being very nearby. And a lot of the food at that scale, if you're going wholesale, for example, goes through distribution hubs, not through the middle of the city anyway. So, you know, it's really about being closer to your customer, finding the best pricing on energy, labor, et cetera, for large vertical farms or large greenhouses. But in the city, there's still a wide range of options. So we focus on that. And, and I think that's a really great place to begin because a lot of people get excited about something they see on the internet about CEA and they come into the space with a lot of naivety. And so they need to have a bit more time to understand their options before making such a large investment for a very capital intensive, higher risk, in some ways, newer way of agriculture. Thanks, Shireen. Um, yeah, just as a as a company that has decided to go into a, a highly urban environment um, in Compton, uh, you know, I, I do think there is a lot of nuance in terms of like picking your partner. And so we had a really great experience with uh, the Compton city government um, in negotiating the terms for uh, our entry into Compton. Um, and what it's allowing us to do really is um, – be very in close proximity to the LA market, obviously, um, but also hire locally and start to provide, um, you know, really high quality, uh, high tech manufacturing jobs essentially to um, this local community, as well as address like food insecurity issues um, in the community. And so it's a really uh, great way for us as we go to scale um, to talk about uh, the benefits of vertical farming um, because essentially we can put them anywhere. Mm -hmm. Thanks, really quick, yeah, just to jump in here, I, I actually agree with everything that was said by Paul um, and Henry and Shireen. And at, at the end of the day, like choosing a site for your vertical farm um, uh, depends on a variety of, of factors. And um, so for, for us, our first farm, um, we, we started farming um, in Ithaca, actually. That was Ed's, some of Ed's first uh, prototypes and designs. But um, our first farm in Newark was a school farm um, at Phillips Academy Charter School um, in 2009. So the small modular unit, and, and the goal of that farm was education and um, teaching kids who grew up in Newark, uh, you know, 
food food insecure um, or not, without with little access to, to fresh food. Um, the in giving them the ability to to, to grow their own food um, in this unique way, and then to eat that food in the cafeteria, and then that built our relationship with the city of Newark. And then in 2016 is when we uh, we started the build out, or we built out our um, uh, our first commercial farm there, um, which is our, our current headquarters. But from from our perspective, um, whether it's in a, a city or l- like like a Newark or a New York City or in um, a, a peri-urban environment, a suburban environment, or or in in the country, um, or rural environment, um, it it we're 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 pretty much agnostic as far as where where where, where that goes. But we're really trying to feed the most mouths um, as efficiently um, as possible. Um, so that that's a little bit of insight there. That's great. Then my next question is more about the sustainability and the technology. So how sustainable do you think CEA technology is? And are there ways that you hope that it would become more sustainable in the future? So so I will, uh, you know, I will first start with, um, I mean, the ultimate sustainability is using the sun. So uh, at the risk of sounding old fashioned, Um, Greenhouses basically are completely designed, uh, you know, by using the sun. And so, therefore, that means you can minimize supplemental grow lights uh, and thereby the carbon footprint and then ultimately the sustainability, you know, of those those, uh, operations. Also, you capture the rainwater that falls on the roof and then you get into your growing where you're using biological control. And then if you can, you know, get the yields, which I think really are, are what drives the cost of production, you can compete um, against the, uh, the, the, the West Coast growers. So I think, you know, using what nature gives us basically for free, and in the Northeast, there's plenty of rain and there's a lot of sunlight, I think that directly ties to lower cost of production, lower carbon footprint, and greater sustainability. Thanks, Paul. Henry? Yeah, I think that there's a long way to go. Uh, So when we're talking about CA, we all know, of course, greenhouses and up to vertical farms, right? So they're very different. I think Paul mentioned that using the sun has a lot of benefits. But, you know, greenhouses have no R value. So you have to heat them and a lot of that energy just dissipates. And if that's coming from, you know, a a carbon source that has its own impact as well. But I think in general, um, my biggest concern is sort of how people are branding CAs automatically sustainable. And I think it's much more complicated than that. There are some obvious benefits and um, some less obvious benefits, but the water savings are the more obvious ones, the reduction of pesticides we've talked about. And I think just focusing on the right solution for the specific problem matters. So, you know, water savings in the Northeast, where there is actually an abundance of water, you can promote that, but, you know, that's not necessarily what that region needs. What that region needs is, is, definitely a lot more food locally um, for freshness, for nutrition, for some of these benefits, less pesticides use, et cetera. So I think we need to really set standards across the industry about how we talk about sustainability as it relates to this and understand that there is not one size fits all. There never has been an agriculture, so we should never pursue one as greater than the other every single time. Instead, we should pursue a broader understanding of impact and the problem at hand that we're trying to solve. And I think in that case, we facilitate a much more diverse food system that's targeted at the specific problems at hand. And so like that's where that's where we come from for it. So some resources related to this, the Association of Vertical Farming actually developed a public sustainability metric scheme for CEA um, with Columbia four years ago. Um, you can find the article, just search Ag Funder Sustainability Vertical Farming. And there's actually multiple metrics where they review certification schemes and consider how you could assess this for greenhouses and vertical farms. It's public. And so I think there's a lot we can each do to, to try and do better. We're, we're trying to do better by simply being more considerate about the language we use as it relates to sustainability, providing more services to our clients to help them understand carbon footprint, providing more data in our software that helps them understand you know, moving towards a life cycle analysis, even if we just start there, because there's still a lot of sustainability questions about CEA and we need to take it on step by step together. Thanks, Alina. Yeah, and just to jump in, this is a this is a topic that, that Henry and I um, uh, discussed at length, and um, it's it's extremely important and complex. 
um, and multifaceted. Uh, and so uh, from, from our perspective, sustainability is, a, is a, it, again, it's, it's almost lost its meaning, right? Um, in uh, over the last couple of years, everybody's sustainable. Everybody is, um, you know, is, is, is environmentally friendly um, today. That, that's a badge of honor that many organizations and companies wear. Um, but, you know, what, what we're trying to do is trying to educate um, our, our customers, our partners, and ourselves continue to educate ourselves about the nuances of sustainability. So we are a certified B Corporation. We went out and pursued this public scorecard um, and renew it year over year to make sure that we hold ourselves accountable, um, not just in terms of our environmental footprint, but, but in terms of our social impact, our hiring practices, um, everything. What is a sustainable business model? What is a sustainable industry, et cetera? Um, but specific to environmental sustainability, um, very often the lens goes straight or the focus goes straight to energy use. Um, the, the earlier comment about, about the sun um, and, and, you know, the sun is free and we have plenty of sunshine. That's very, very true. And we need more greenhouse infrastructure in this country. Um, most of Europe is under glass. We hardly have any greenhouse infrastructure in, in the U.S. So there are huge opportunities to use that technology. But we also have to understand what we're comparing, what we're growing. So um, we're growing very uh fast turnover crops um, locally, very, very close to where our customers are. So we're, we're, uh, our farms are strategically positioned along, um, um, along uh, you know, transportation lines that are just about a mile away from our distribution facility. So we don't really have to truck much. We grow our product, we drop it right off to our customers, and we're done. So most leafy greens um, that, are mentioned, that, that, that we talked about a little bit earlier are grown um, you know, in Salinas Valley, California, or, or in Arizona, about 90% of them, they have to be trucked all year round to the rest of the United States. We're eliminating that completely. And when you grow locally, when you choose to grow locally, or, or when you design your farm around local production, local distribution, you're eliminating that. You're also eliminating most of the food waste that happens along the supply chain, right? You're maximizing freshness, minimizing the time on the truck, maximizing the amount of time at the store. So um, then you're cutting... Uh, a big chunk of that as well. So from a life cycle analysis perspective, we have to be very thoughtful about the comparisons of, of CEA to, to field farming and, and how to define sustainability. Um, but we, we don't have a life cycle analysis. That's the main problem, Neil. And I know that Cornell is doing some work on that, but you know, farms are claiming benefits. They're listing benefits, but not talking about the carbon footprint. And that's really greenwashing. And so we need to have other standards to really dig deeper. You can't pick and choose benefits and list some on your site and not talk about the downsides. That's not educating the consumers or the audience or the investors. So I think having an academic group that's, you know, independent from industry is really helpful to have a life cycle analysis comparing field grown to greenhouse to vertical on a specific crop in a specific market. Now, when we do the analysis, we've done this for some clients you know, again, as a private company, a consulting company, we find that vertical farms across most categories have sometimes 10 times higher carbon footprint. So even if you account for the transportation by truck, even if you account for food waste, you know, we have to really have the full story of the materials used to build the field farms, materials used to build the greenhouses, you know, the, the, the waste reduction. It's very complicated. It's, and so that's where we need an, an, a group that has sort of an academic capacity to do this is what's needed for that. That would move this industry forward from a sustainability perspective enormously. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because beyond carbon footprint, there's the embodied energy, there's the input, exactly. the pesticide use, for example, and exactly. there are environmental implications. Mm -hmm. um, Plastic, is, lights, mm -hmm. microchips, it's, it's a lot, you know? So it's, we don't know. It's a very complex thing. We're, we're working on it through a National Science Foundation funded project. Um, uh, let's, <laughs> yeah, let's see. I want, I want to turn now to um, questions that have been coming in from the attendees because there's been a bunch of them. Um, so I think uh, Isabel and I will kind of alternate um, asking questions that we've kind of cherry picked from, from the attendees. All right. So a bunch of you have been asking about different crops that could be grown in CEA beyond just leafy greens. So um, we'll expand that to... Um, asking do you so how do you guys see um the crops that are actually being grown under C cda conditions expanding in the future so perennial crops fruit trees um vegetables other small fruits where do you guys see the crops 
grown and these systems going. Paul, you have to unmute. Yep. So commercially successful crops, basically outside of leafy greens, which is relatively a newcomer. The established guys are, are the big ones, tomatoes, cucumbers, eggplants. Uh, those are probably, um, you know, the big three. And of course, peppers is number four. And, and then from there, I mean, you're seeing a lot of development now in berries. Uh, you know, I'm kind of bullish that berries, especially strawberries, that, that's going to be uh, the next major um, CEA crop, along with leafy greens. Um, outside of kind of um, what I would call sort of, uh, you know, those fruiting um, and leafy greens and, and strawberries, I, I don't see a role for CEA in perennial crops, uh, fruit trees. That's just an opinion. But traveled the world and I've seen what our what I view are successful commercial models and I think it kind of sticks within the crops that I that I just identified. Yeah I think it's good to ask yourself the question like will somebody pay more for its freshness and and does that really matter right so I was invited to speak at the international baking convention about vertical farming and I said you know don't waste your money like I, I can give you the answer now and he said no come tell us why not I think we calculated the loaf of bread might be like $13 or something like that. And, and so, you know, because it's something that ships easily, it stores easily, that there's no reason to, to grow it, you know, close to customer and CEA in that sense. Edible biomass matters. If we're controlling the environment and we have a low edible biomass, we're growing so much more biomass besides the fruit that or the vegetable we're eating. Lettuce is 95%, right? Or, or, um, and tomatoes, you know, maybe less. So, you know, that's a consideration as well. How it ships, how fresh it is, will the customer pay more for it? Um, these are some of the considerations. So try to think about the drivers in the local region that are going to justify all that capital, land prep, construction, operational management. What's going to justify that initial capex? Because for CEA, it's always the upfront capex. That's like, you know, that's the big flag, right? And if you plan that properly, it can work, but it has to be the right crop and there has to be the right conditions for that crop to be bought consistently from the customer and compete with the competition like Paul is doing. Yeah, I can jump in real quick. I um, So at Air Farms, we're, of course, we're like other um, vertical farming companies, our, our main commercial focus is leafy green vegetables, but uh, we've recently announced some pretty robust part partnerships on um, strawberries, tomatoes, blueberries, even with, with a Chilean company called Horta Fruit and cane berries. So we're really bullish on um, seeing how far we can go in terms of other crops. And we've grown non-commercially hundreds of types of crops. Um, and so what I, with vertical farming and CEA in general, we're kind of just at the beginning stages of discovery when it comes to the kinds of things that we can grow um, and how uh, and, and, and things that we can grow efficiently. Um, when it comes to commercial production today, we're quite limited, but I really, I, I feel really optimistic about what we can commercialize in the coming years and decades. Thank you, Alina. Um, let's see, another question that came in is, what role do you see robotics and automation taking place in CEA compared to field agriculture? Well, I'll take a crack at that one. Um, I mean, I think development of automation and development of systems that are going to replace sort of redundant work, backbreaking work that has been part of, of field agriculture is something that um, we're, we are doing at Little Leaf Farms, and, and there's a lot of very interesting technology. Our 10 acres of greenhouses, you don't see anybody inside them right, other than growers who are walking and checking the crop, but there is absolutely no need for human intervention um, and, and as the crop basically grows up through harvest, up through packaging. So um, I think agriculture has had a lot of tough jobs over the years because it's tough work. So I think with development of technology and automation uh, to, and also to offset the, as as Henry said about the upfront capital costs, you really need that to control your operating costs. So I think it's here to stay. It's only going to get better. Thank you. Um, Shireen. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, plenty has, um, is, is probably the most like forward leaning in terms of uh, technology as a differentiator for our 
um, farm. And uh, it's really essential for us, both in terms of um, expanding sort of vertical production capacity uh, to be able to continue to automate at scale as we have, as well as um, really take advantage of sort of the data and the insights uh, to monitor our everything from our plant health to um, making sure that we are, you know, managing our, our entire uh, business operations. And so, uh, you know, automation um, is really important and it also helps to provide, you know, jobs and skills for people in a very different way than traditional farm work does. Um, and so uh, I think that's the part of it that's that's really exciting. Um, and, you know, we are going to need to continue to invest in this space uh, and it, it's only gonna get, you know, better over time. Thank you, anyone else? I mean, I'll say again, I think it's about a strategy as well, a little bit, like obviously we're moving more towards automation but think about, you know, that upfront capex, is it worth it? What kind of farm do you actually want to operate? I think if you're running a for-profit wholesale farm and it's a greenhouse, automation technology is mature. Like it's really ready for that. Build an at-scale greenhouse and do that. I think that's that's definitely more proven than, I'm not sure what at-scale vertical farming is yet, to be honest, for example. And so, and that's the difference I want to, you know, think about what what's going to work for you and your business, how much capital you're going to be able to raise, Think about what crop you want to grow. Think about the location. And that'll determine how much automation is going to matter. In some markets, people are getting, farms are getting paid a lot of money to create jobs. You can design farming businesses around creating more labor. I'm not saying in the long term that we don't want automation to improve those jobs, as Shireen was mentioning, make them great jobs. But there's still a lot of markets that, you know, don't necessarily need to go to automation right away. So one of one of our attendees brought up an interesting point, which this being that uh, Walmart just announced that it's committing to source 100% of fresh produce that they sell in store from suppliers that adopt IPM practices by 2025. So the question was, do you see grocery stores further pushing demand for CEA projects where in regions where IPM requirements for farms are at a minimum? Yes. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yes, yes. The you know, the consumers don't want to be worried about pesticide residue or any other kind of chemical residue on the product that they eat. So it's uh, that's the trend. Walmart, you know, Whole Foods, many others. The whole organic movement. It's basically it's here to stay. Food safety. Anyone else want to talk about their, their IPM programs? Um, in, in general, um, in CA operations, we see very strong um, IPM programs that have been adopted. So I think that's a really nice niche that, that CEA can address. Absolutely. Um, the next audience question that I'm going to ask, um, this one's a little bit more out there or, or thinking about outside the box. So we want to think about um, less developed countries um, and how CEA might fit into their economy. Um, and then they asked kind of specifically, if we think of like Asia, uh, I think Africa could fit here. There's millions of family farms and farmers that still dominate kind of uh, many of the agricultural production systems. Are there a way that, um, uh, say, less developed countries or small family farms can benefit from CEA? So I, Kip, I can jump in. I think this is so exciting because as the CEA technology advances, we have an opportunity to um, present the knowledge of that to more developing countries and, and they, they can adapt in different ways. And here's some examples. Agritecture is working with Farms Not Arms to develop simplified hydroponics in refugee camps. Syrian refugees have now become permanent residents, essentially, in Lebanon without status. Their refugee camps are now becoming their, ho their homes. So we went through a process of choosing between agroforestry and permaculture methods and some simplified greenhouses. You know, CA doesn't have to be ultra high tech. Um, in Gabon, we worked with a woman that won a World Bank grant. And, you know, they have actually an abundance of produce, but the roads are so bad from the farms to the city, to Libreville. So 
you know, she wanted to convert a vacant lot. And so we did some hydroponics there. We had to come up with simplified strategies to cool and, and manage humidity, which is super tough. But if you think about it enough, there's ways you can innovate. You lose consistency, right? You're not going to get the same consistency that you'll get out of Paul's farm, but you are going to get certain advantages to extend the season, et cetera. Um, so I think it's really exciting what could be possible. As far as Asia is concerned, I, mean, I think India is, is enormously primed for growth in the sector um, with hydroponics. I think there's already so much of it happening. We're getting tons and tons of requests from there. The interest uh, from Indian entrepreneurs to get involved in this is enormous. So I think that's a region that is not going to be able to afford the high capex that we're used to here, um, but needs and, and, and can actually execute CEA in interesting ways there. Nice. Um, Alina or Shireen, do you have thoughts? Yeah, this really, this isn't my area of expertise, but um, also was um, tangentially involved with, with Farms Not Arms, um, started by a friend of ours. Um, and really, I, I, the way that I'm, I'm, my vision for this sector is the same way that, you know, no one had a cell phone and now everyone has a cell phone. <laughs> Um, I'm hoping that in the future, the um, all of the upfront work um, and mindshare um, that uh, we are applying into this sector as we continue to evolve the technology with economies of scale and abundance of data and open source data, we'll be able to um, spread that efficiently um, and effectively to, um, to, to other countries. Um, that might not have those opportunities today, but I, I, I think that there's going to be a, a huge, um, you know, a huge, a huge shift in the coming decade. And Shireen? Yeah, um, so I think uh, there is in the very long term lots of potential here, but certainly for vertical farming, uh, you're limited by um, electricity needs. So having spent a lot of time in the developing world and uh, across Asia and Africa, you know, there's just certain countries where it's not going to be viable for a very, very long time. And then there are um, countries like India, China, much of the Middle East that look at these in more um National, from a national security interest, whether that's food supply or like in India, you have 14 or 15 cities that are going to be completely water insecure, you know, in the next, you know, five to 10 years. And so um, those are the places where I think we'll first see more um, interest as well as uh, ability to build these kind of farms. And then, you know, in the, in the longer term, we can spread it out. But the reality is like all these climate change uh, impacts that we're going to talk about, you um, especially the sort of water, uh, the, the impending water crisis is going to drive this space, right? So like, you know, in 20 or 30 years, there's going to be like real acceleration. I mean, we see it, we're seeing some acceleration now, but you know, it's going to become real to people right now. There's a failure of imagination on what we are facing in terms of um, climate change and the impact on agriculture. And that will change uh, in the next coming decades. Absolutely. Thanks, Right. So another question. Um, so federally, do you guys see there being um, either more policies going forward that would push the space or do you, are there any policies that currently exist that you see as pushing along the CEA industry? On the federal level in the U.S.? Um, I think the, the CEA um, Food Safety Coalition is an interesting approach. So we talked about food safety earlier, and I think working together on proven benefits of CEA is a really great way to lobby and collaborate because we all have something to gain from that. So I think that's a really great coalition. I think research, uh, collaborating on research around innovation, on energy and lighting, and climate control related to the sector can benefit a lot of other sectors besides just CEA and can generate a lot of engineers and talent. So I think that's an area that should also be pushed on. But I think in general, it's been much slower than it needs to be. And I think that failure of imagination that Shereen mentioned is part of that. There's so many other competing priorities. And I agree that water is going to be probably the breaking point. Yeah, I, I would add to that that you know, right, right now the produce industry is an unsubsidized free market enterprise. So um, you can say that's, that's good or you can say it's bad, right? Depending on your point of view. I, I think it's a good thing. Um, are there grants available at state, local? Are there federal support programs available at USDA? Yes, they are. But they're always cost sharing. And, you know, there's not a lot of sort of like big pots of money that you can go to without all kinds of strings attached 
without having to match or or more so. So, you know, that's just the way it is. I think, you know, what's happening now with the growth of CEA, it's kind of in response to the problems that the West Coast field growers have had, right? Food safety being number one. Yes, there's there's water and other issues, ability to get farm workers, um, et cetera, development pressure. So, I mean, I would say that we have some tailwinds and, you know, the success of our company and others, I think, um, are, are emblematic of that. And I, I think that trend's going to continue. Serene? Um, I spend a fair amount of time speaking with policymakers in, in my role, and it is pretty interesting how little knowledge they have about the space still. So most of them are kind of unaware of uh, vertical farming and um, sort of the potential and the issues. And you sort of have to like back them up four or five steps to explain to them the problem. Why is this necessary? And then walk, walk through like the programmatic challenges that, um, Paul was describing where oftentimes uh, we don't fit into the requirements. So it's either there's a heavy rural requirement or uh, there's sort of a, uh, you're, you either don't qualify for something because they say you're um, not rural or you don't qualify for something because they say you're agriculture and not manufacturing or manufacturing, not agriculture. Right. So there's all these kind of nuances to these programs. Um, and so uh, we have a long way to go in terms of educating policymakers. Um, I think that's a, a shared goal for all of us. Uh, I think another shared goal is um, making sure that we have sort of power upgrades across the country as well as, um, you know, a move more to renewable. And I'm hopeful with this administration that we're going to see more of a push uh, in these spaces. Um, but we really do uh, need to um, reframe the problem for policy bankers because they don't quite see it. Most of them don't quite see it, in my opinion. Thank you. Uh, we've had several questions come in that um, relate to um, energy use or energy cost. Um, I wonder if anyone would be willing to speak about, you know, where does energy kind of line up in terms of the cost of goods sold? Um, what are the bottlenecks or what are the, you know, possible opportunities that are coming up for, um, for that cost? Um, so again, that varies a lot in the market where you can have a lot of different costs related to energy. But when we typically see, we see that there's, um, between lighting, for, for example, from a vertical farm between lighting and then climate control, all energy could be 40% sometimes, and that can be divided relatively evenly. But if you're in a market where some of the energy costs are higher, that number could get even, you know, to the higher end of those 40s sometimes. So it's really a lot. If you want to test it out, we, we built a software called Agriculture Designer. You input in the dimensions of any vertical farm or greenhouse in the world. You input your zip code in. It'll give you an estimate for the energy consumption um, for that facility. So you can just take a look at your own market. It breaks down the chart of OPEX and capital cost, and it'll give you a 10-year projection based on typical numbers that we see in, in the industry. And you can input in your own energy costs and labor costs. So that's the best way to, to take a quick look. Yeah, from, from my experience, you know, the COGS basically is representative of uh, growing, which are seed, fertilizer, substrate, packaging, obviously, and then labor. And energy is a distant fourth. Uh, it's single digits as a percentage of sales. It's not a major part, you know, of our of our cogs or of our business. And um, a lot of that ties to, you know, the the way we've designed our greenhouses and yield. So and also by we use a greenhouse. So we don't have um, the need for supplemental grow lights. We do use supplemental grow lights during the fall, winter and spring and then cloudy days in other parts of the year. But for the most part, um, we're, we're relying on the sun and you're relying on the sun and you're going to spend less money in energy. Paul, what about gas though? Is that also accounted for? Yes, kind of we use natural gas and we use the modern uh, Dutch style condensing boilers. So, you know, they operated over 95% efficiency. Um, you know, we, we recycled the CO2. So, you know, it's, it's, we're getting every last molecule of energy out of that you know, out of that, you know, cubic, cubic meter of natural gas. So, uh, and it's, uh, you know, again, relative as a percentage of sales, it's a, it's a small cost. Shereen? Um, so, so for us, because we are, um, you know, vertical farm, indoor vertical farm, so we use all grow lights, um, LED lights, uh, you, you know, energy is 
a big portion of um, our GHG sort of uh, footprint. Um, and the way that we've managed that is really um, first by sourcing our energy in responsible ways. So uh, our farm in San Francisco is 100% renewable, half solar, half wind. Um, and then we have actually really invested in our tech platforms. So we actually have our own proprietary grow lights. Uh, we have about 200 patents on different types of technology. You know, we are in, in, in Silicon Valley as well. So we have um, the sort of engineering talent to help us uh, with those uh, like improvements. But at the end of the day, um, you know, we really do need a greener grid across the entire country, right? Like it, we're, we're all consuming energy um, in some ways. And so that's a piece that is uh, really important. Um, and then, you know, having a really robust energy strategy. So like, you know, we were talking about greenwashing earlier, and there's a lot of different ways to kind of say you're green. Um, and so making sure that like within the sort of ranges of what's possible, that you are responsibly sourcing uh, your energy, trying to source that from local sources um, and really being diligent about um, the, those pieces are, are what we're doing today. And we hope over time um, we can be even more increasingly efficient as well as uh, use responsible sources. Great, thanks. Um, I think we'll um, try to get one more quick question in before we wrap things up. Um, Isabel, do you want uh, to go next? Yeah, so uh, as a final question, um, how, how do you all see CEA um, helping low-income families potentially in the future um, have access to more healthy, affordable produce um, grown locally? Yeah, I can, I can take a little bit of that one. Um, so uh, we, we built our first farm um, in Newark and um, part of our strategy is really around um, how to make sure that we're um, creating an infrastructure that's beneficial to the community of Newark um, and uh, providing jobs. So year round um, fair wage jobs um, with benefits, um, ongoing growth opportunities, et cetera. And we actually have a, um, we have a partnership um, with the New Jersey reentry program as well to um, work with folks to give them second chances um, who, who might be left out of the, um, of the, uh, you know, in, of, of our national employment infrastructure. Um, so that's, that's a little bit of, we, our philosophy is really how to not, not just to put a bandaid on an issue, um, but how to um, really create uh uh, solutions for, for the long term. Um, and that's why the discussion earlier about automation versus not automation is an interesting one because on the one hand, um, you know, it's going to become increasingly more um, e easier to create uh, high tech farms, um, vertical farms with a lot of automation in the, in the near future, but is it worth it? Um, and should we be doing that? So it's not a question of can we, but should we? Um, and where can vertical farms really help um, uh, different communities? Um, from 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 that standpoint, and then also recently a, a, a program that we that we um, are participating in with the World Economic Forum and the City of Jersey City. Um, it's a it's a multi year um, program where we're building small farms, small smaller units in around ten different community centers, and um, th those community centers are going to be growing fresh fresh food, fresh leafy greens, and then all of that um, uh, yield is gonna be going out to the community for free. Um, and so again, the yield isn't going to be tremendously high, um, but the idea there is to, to really um, spark the imagination of folks who live in, um, in Jersey City and um, give, them, give them sort of, a, a get them excited about, about fresh food and, around, uh, and, and there's an education component to that, nutrition education component to that, um, et cetera. So there are many, many ways to um, help with uh, food security and with um, providing fresh, healthy food um, to, to different communities. And so those are some of the ways that we're participating in that. Great. Um, Shireen? 
Yeah. So, um, you know, it's really important to, to us that we, um, give back to the communities that we, you know, work in. So, um, you know, San Francisco Bay area, we have partnerships with, um, a couple of the large food banks, as well as um, Project Open Hand, which is a sort of food as medicine program. Um, and so during COVID, we did triple our donations in addition to tripling our, our um, you know, production to uh, for-profit channels. Um, and as we go into Compton, you know, the biggest thing for us is, is hiring locally. So making sure that a good portion of the jobs in Compton go to people who live in that community. It's a community that has per capita income of about $17,000 a year. So, um, you know, providing jobs is like a big deal to that community, um, as well as we are um, going to be donating produce through uh, multiple local organizations. We are already supporting um, some local community gardens with uh, giving away food during the uh, COVID crisis. Um, and then we're, you know, we are working um, with, uh, local stores too, to make sure that our produce is not just produced in Compton, but it's actually sold in Compton as well. In addition to giving, giving, um, giving it away, uh, through appropriate channels. Thank you. Um, I think we'll have to end it here. This has gone by very quickly for me. I really want to thank our panelists for giving, um, so much of their, their time and their openness. Um, and I'd just like to call Mark up for a few closing notes. Thanks, Neil. Now, that was a great discussion on such an important topic, and, and I was really uh, moved by the enthusiasm of, of all of our participants submitting questions uh, and keeping that discussion alive. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank Alina and Henry, Paul, Shireen, as well as Neil and Isabel for, uh, for moderating this session and joining us here today. Uh, I hope folks will join us for our next CBIS sessions, which are both scheduled for tomorrow, April 15th. The first panel will take place at 6 p.m. Uh, Eastern Daylight Time, and will focus on the next frontier for business, social justice, and sustainability. The second panel will begin at 8 p.m. Uh, Eastern Daylight Time, when we, when we will be discussing pathways to social and environmental careers. Until then, I hope everybody has a good day and stay safe.